So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We want to extend a warm welcome to all of you joining us from around the world. We're delighted to have so many people from Northern Ireland, the broader UK, the Republic of Ireland, and across the United States that are participating in this webinar. And we even have people listening in from Colombia, Palestine, Myanmar, South Africa, and more. So thank you for joining us. My name is Terry Murphy. I'm the Associate Director at the Mershon Center for International Security Studies. On the screen with me today is Dr. Martha Minow from Harvard Law School and, Duncan, and Dr. Duncan Morrow from Ulster University. And we'll be introducing them to you shortly. Additionally, we have representatives from the two other co-sponsors of this event. Carl Smallwood is with us and he's the Executive Director of the Divided Community Project a collaboration of legal scholars, lawyers, mediators, dispute design experts, and experienced leaders who work alongside communities here in the United States where there is intense fracture and discord. Carl will be entering the conversation toward the end of it, and he will close out our webinar today. Shona Bell works at Ireland's oldest peace center, Corimila. The center is supported by a dispersed community of passionate and engaged individuals who, individuals who have worked on behalf of peace within and between the UK, the Republic of Ireland, and throughout the world for almost 60 years. The impact of their collective effort is immense, ranging from working in schools among disenfranchised, disenfranchised youth, newly settled refugees, to facilitating incredibly difficult intergroup processes. We're excited to listen into a conversation between Martha and Duncan, but before proceeding, I wanna quickly offer some context for this discussion. For the past year and a half, we have been part of a growing international network of government and civil society leaders, scholars, policy framers, and peace practitioners who want to learn from each other and to share knowledges across various divides. Together with today's co-sponsors and other amazing partners, we have convened several international learning platforms, working groups, and symposia focused on a range of issues impacting countries and communities attempting to transition from violence to peace. A key priority at the Mershon Center is conducting research on what it means and what it takes to recover from violence. Co-leading this effort with me is Dr. Holly Nessus Brem and Dr. Trey Billing, and we've been so grateful to be part of such a rich and dynamic exchange. Throughout these gatherings, several stubborn questions keep bubbling up. How do we deal with the contested past, especially when people cannot, cannot and will not agree on a narrative? What does it mean to pursue justice in the aftermath of widespread, systematic, or historic violation? Is justice even possible? How do you repair harms that have been expressed through decades, if not centuries? How do we interrupt cycles of violence, intense hatred, and fear? What is the role of truth? And whose truth prevails? What about forgiveness, social transformation, healing, or hope for a different future? We recognize that histories here in the United States are different from histories in Northern Ireland. We know that the tense fault lines in Belfast are not the same tense fault, tense fault lines in Cape Town. We understand that justice mechanisms that might work at the internationals for say Rwanda wouldn't work in the context of Iraq. We know that expressions of traditional and local justice are unique contextual and they are intimate. What works in Memphis wouldn't make sense in Beirut. There isn't an answer, but there are certainly consistent and important considerations for those of us working in and on transitions. Our hope today is to invite you into that wrestle of these questions. I now want to introduce to you Shona Bell. She is my dear friend, colleague, and an experienced mediator of over 20 years. She's currently working on a range of projects related to sectarianism and its residual violence in Northern Ireland. Shona, over to you. Thank you, Terry. You're such a good friend to us here. So pleased to see such a great gathering 
Uh, we're so grateful to see staff members and community members and government representatives and youth workers and educators and all our other friends from our islands here and beyond. Um, our time with Dr Minow is so valuable and we don't want to lose a moment. So we want to focus on learning from her experience and scholarship. We also realise that questions are really important. So we reached out to a range of stakeholders and instead of inviting Q&A online, we're inviting Duncan to bring those questions to life. So um, I'm sure you would love, we'd all love to get into the debate, but I think on this occasion, we're going to listen uh, and hear. We're delighted to be co-hosting this event today and it's my pleasure to welcome our conversation host this afternoon, uh, this evening or this morning, depending where you are. Our moderator and host today is Dr. Duncan Morrow, a professor of politics at the University of Ulster. He's well known throughout the world for his work in peace building and he's played an active leadership role in our growing international network. So um, we're delighted that he's gonna host this conversation today. Additionally, Duncan is a member of Corrie Miller community, and he and Martha are both members of Facing History and Ourselves, which is an education initiative that's been central to Corrie Miller's efforts in working with teachers, developing curriculum and overcoming, uh, or working towards overcoming sectarian divides. He's passionate about seeking peace and pursuing it, and we are grateful to have him with us today um, to guide us in this conversation. Duncan, over to you. Thank you very much, Jonah. Thank you very much, Terry. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming. And as they say, good morning, good evening, and good night. And it all means one thing here. So wonderful. Um, this is a huge opportunity for me and a huge pleasure for me. Uh, I met Martha a few years ago. It's hard to know just how long the years are now with lockdown. It was a few years ago we spent a week considering some of the questions that we're going to consider today, just some of the real challenges for peace builders within an organization called Facing History and Ourselves, which always seems to me to be a really important title. There's nobody more qualified in the entire world than Martha Minow to speak about this because she has spent so much time thinking about it. She is the 300th anniversary university professor at Harvard University, having served as the Dean of Harvard Law School for eight years and she has been one of the leading lights of academic and practical and engaged law across the world. Her publication record is phenomenal, but just some of the themes that has been raised early publication between vengeance and forgiveness, facing history and genocide and mass violence, but then also whole other issues around engaging cultural differences, around what does fairness mean in a culturally diverse society and equality, and then most recently, turning our attention to the issue of the press, saving the news, why the constitution calls for government action to preserve freedom of speech. Martha, it's a huge honor and thank you very much for agreeing to doing this with us. Oh, Duncan, I'm so honored to be here and to be in conversation with you. We have, um, as you know, uh, here, and I understand also everywhere really in many ways where there's been conflict, uh, had to wrestle with the real question of so much injustice has been done in the past, so much harm has been caused, so much hurt still exists in the community. And I suppose the starting question I have for you is what is so critical about that that it continues to come back? Why does the past refuse to lie down? You always uh, ask the easy questions. Thank you, Duncan. You know, I have uh, on my background here an image from the Nuremberg trials following World War II, um, which was in many ways an effort to try to tame vengeance and revenge. I've spent a lot of time thinking about vengeance and revenge as not so terrible, that they in many ways reflect a pretty powerful and important instinct and impulse to pursue justice, to our identify what's been wrong. And one of the great qualities that human beings have is that ability to perceive a wrong and to know that this is not right and I deserve better. I also think that the past keeps persisting in part because we are narrative narrating human beings. We try to make sense of our world and our experience. And so 
when there has been horror or violence, we're still trying to make sense of it, but it can't be. It's beyond so many of the kinds of societal violence, uh, family violence, it's beyond uh, recognition. I turn often to art uh, to try to see how have the artists guided us. And there's a interesting play called The Marriage of Bet and Boo by the playwright uh, Christopher Durang, where the people on the uh, in the family that is depicted in the play who've died don't disappear. They're still there on the stage. And people have to walk around them. And that's just, for me, is such a perfect concrete expression about the past. It's not gone, even though the people are gone or the events seem to have disappeared. You know, William Faulkner, the great uh, novelist from the United States, famously said, the past is not dead, it's not even past. And I think that that's why it feels like it's not, it keeps coming back. We, we need rituals, we need mechanisms, we need processes to help us safely put the past in the past, but we live in worlds that constantly deny the past or compete over their narrative. And, and I think that's why it keeps dwelling in, within us. So you said something really interesting there, you know, that sometimes <laughs> revenge is one of the motivators behind identifying something wrong and knowing something's wrong. I'd like to hear you say a little bit more about that. Is there, because for example, uh, some people would say in the United States context in 9-11, for example, that the whole Afghan war was started because of a, a wish for revenge for something terrible that the whole community had experienced on television. So, and 3000 people or more than 3000 people had been killed completely without uh, any warning or any foreknowledge. So, what I'd like to hear you talk about revenge, both its positive side, if there is one, but also at what point does it start to eat itself? At what point, or does it start to eat itself? Do we start to eat ourselves with revenge? You know, the 9-11 is very much still with us uh, and we've just had an anniversary and you, there have been many interviews with children whose parents were killed and their lives are altered. Um, uh, you talk about the US invasion of Afghanistan. How about the US invasion of Iraq? I mean, oftentimes um, the impulse to revenge leads to just unrelated lashing out and more destruction and more death. Um, I do want to rescue this one colonel from revenge that is admirable, which is the sense that there are wrongs and they should not go unnamed and unrecognized. But it, it that very impulse can go so badly uh, because there, it will never be satisfied and creating these endless cycles of violence and revenge that then prompt a return of revenge from those who feel harmed and wronged by uh, my vengeance, that's, that's the danger. And breaking those cycles seems to me the challenge of human civilization, the challenge of each family. How do we not replicate what was bad in our past? Uh, we, living here on this side of, of the Atlantic, we have both a history where uh, people would look at their history and identify the wrongs that were done for them and then other people who say that that wrong has driven a revenge which has forced them to take to, to if you like do more wrong and so the cycles go go round and round you've got that picture of Nuremberg behind you I uh, just you got, you got you rid just of it, it off. <laughs> and I, it made me think that was probably the most dramatic and public effort to try to bring revenge under law. And I suppose my question to you is, have we evolved law which is capable of dealing with the past? I think it's a, a struggle and I think it's an admirable one, but no is the answer because uh, the past is bigger than any of the institutions that human beings have constructed to manage it. Um, I do think that the effort to tame 
revenge with law is true in international affairs. It's true in domestic criminal law. Um, it's an effort. It's partial. It also has the terrible consequence of empowering governments that can then themselves do bad things, as our criminal law system in the United States uh, often uh, demonstrates. We are the most incarcerated nation in the history of the planet. Something's gone terribly wrong. I mean, I do think that the effort of the Nuremberg trials that is inspiring is the effort to bring within the framework of accountability what happened, which then called for facts and dispassionate pursuit of the truth, giving the uh, defendants the chance to defend themselves, not just to be killed, which some of the political leaders thought, let's just take them out back and shoot them, but trying to actually be better than the harms. That's the admirable part. And the, the UN created the tribunals for the former Yugoslavia, for Rwanda. Now we have the International Criminal Court trying to continue this work. But has it worked? You know, each trial goes on for years. It's slow. It's painstaking. The amount of money that's spent on it, uh, people have rightly raised the question, is it worth it? Um, I, these are very, very tough questions. And no, we haven't solved this. But our, there's something admirable about the effort. So there's two questions running around my head, uh, or responses almost to what, what, what you said there. One, that really interesting phrase that the, the past, especially these kind of issues that we're dealing with, these atrocities, these genocides, these terrible policies which had huge impacts on generations and so on is always bigger than the institutions that we have and I think that's a really interesting idea so if that is true is there I suppose the first question is what else beyond law do we need what other things do we need to think about at least as tools to help us uh, in dealing with those terrible experiences and we will leave you that one as the first one, and then I'll come back to my second question. I think that there are other resources. Law can be one tool, but I think that art is a great uh, all, uh, addition or alternative. And by that, I mean artistic works like theater, like dance, like poetry, um, but also song and also uh, the kind of art that you don't just watch, but you participate in. So engaging our own bodies in the activity of singing or of, uh, of dancing. Um, I also think that rituals, rituals that can take the form of a day of remembering, um, rituals that can take the form of, you know, doing service, turning your pain into serving others, I think another um, avenue uh, that's related to law, but not the same are commissions of inquiry. And especially when they are organized to try to build a curriculum for the next generation, I think there's real power in that. So that the struggle over the narrative um, is something that's deliberate and collective and not another source of ongoing fight or suppression. Um, but I, I would be interested in your thought, Duncan. What do you think are other tools? Yes, I suppose um, we have had um, a, a period where we had a political deal and we have also got a struggle then over legal frameworks. And I am always struggling over at one level or other, those are the essential criteria, but they're not enough. It's extremely clear to me, exactly as you said, that for these bigger issues, there are so many aspects which no court process can deal with, no political process into the future uh, can withstand in some ways if too much of the past comes out in a certain way. And so, um, as you say, all of those things 
have have to be thought about. How do we teach the future? How do we mem remember the past? How do we uh, make relationships which don't simply repeat or at least in some kind of way harbor or incubate what is going to be uh, next? And all of those have to be done alongside, as you say, doing justice to the reality that something wrong happened here. Something wrong happened here and something has to be. And I, I'm interested because, you know, if you're dealing with something like foreign occupation or something really massive like a post-imperial crisis where you're coming to terms with that or in the United States case with slavery and the huge ramifications that, that went on well past even the abolition of slavery. How, would a commission, is, is what, what, are commissions helpful? Are they possibilities? Uh, what 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 opportunities do they offer? Do they offer a, a, a way of exploring the past in public, which at least allows us to construct a different narrative? They can, but they can also be their own um, problem. I think the Northern Ireland has been, in many ways, victimized by too many inquiries, um, as if okay, if we just do it one more time, we'll get it right. Um, I, I, I think that the one reason that uh, it's often at least a good ingredient to dealing with the past is that a commission of inquiry is itself the, by being created by, by, by starting, is an acknowledgement. And so many terrible horrors are accompanied by denial, by suppression. Um, you know, I think about the uh, disappeared in Argentina um, and the silence around it. Um, and uh, there's a wonderful artist named Doris uh, Salcedo who does sculpture that's trying to make palpable what was denied for so long. So I think a commission can at least say we're not going to do that. It can also give victims and survivors a chance to be heard. And the very act of being heard itself can be a step towards a future. But if it's just, okay, we're going to have another commission. Look, I've been an administrator. You know, this is the tried and true method of people in power to deal with a problem. We'll create a group to go look at it and then hope it'll go away. And that's a, a you know, that's the worst of all uh, possibilities. So I think that there has to be a sequel. There has to be some kind of commitment. That what will come out of this? You know, I think one of the struggles around the world with truth and reconciliation commissions is whether to view them as an alternative to criminal sanction, or yeah. are they instead the method for generating the names? and the evidence for a criminal sanction. And that ambivalence has been present in community after community. You know, South Africa had the interesting, but let's be frank, political compromise to say, no, there will be no prosecutions for those who come and seek uh, forgiveness, who seek amnesty, um, with the hope then of breaking silence, of having more knowledge, more evidence. Um, but in some places, when the evidence comes out, the idea that there would be no consequence is itself unacceptable. I, I do think that um, it's also interesting to learn from the South African experience about what kind of setting will be viewed by people from different sides as a fair one. And if the judicial process is itself associated with a terrible regime, that's not a setting that will lend credence and legitimacy. Um, similarly, if uh, religious institutions were involved in abuse, then that can't lend the aura. So we have to be creative. And I think above all, think about who's the we? Who's the we that's involved in constructing a process about getting from there to here and from here to a future. Do you think, um, I, I'm gonna use an old word like um, lament, uh, that some things have to be, uh, become the past 
In other words, there are cruelties. There are, and I'm, I'm where I'm most hesitant is using the word have to, because I think the implication of the word have to is to ask victims who've, who've carried something that something has to go away, but is, are there possibilities of public acknowledgement of, and I'm going to use a slight tautology here, unacknowledged pain. In other words, that there are some things which are public processes can only indicate, but they cannot finally take away. You know, embedded in your very thoughtful question is this complex interaction of the individual's experience and the social experience. And the have to, I think, is problematic when it's directed at an individual to be told you have to let it go. It's just not a helpful sentence. No. Uh, and it's a kind of denial again. And it's an expression of uh, power. People who have been through trauma and through violence um, will be better off if they let it go, but they can't be just told you have to let it go. They have to find a way and with help work through it. But one of those ways is to have the armature, the structure provided by a social process. And I do think that societies that have experienced great horrors need to find a way to locate those horrors in the past rather than have them feel like they're still going on. I was very affected by an insight of, by Michael Ignatieff, one of the great uh, scholars who writes about the area that has been called Yugoslavia, that uh, is, you know, Western Russia, that has gone through so many wars and imperialism and divisions over time. And he so powerfully says, when you talk to someone right now, you can't always tell whether the atrocity that they're describing happened 10 years ago or 100 years ago or 300 years ago or we 600 years ago. We know this very well. Ago. You know we that. Know very well. Mm -hmm. and, and I, and I, I have seen that in my own uh, community. And the reason that that's the case is that those past traumas are still around. And often when carried through the generations, the descendants don't even feel a kind of entitlement to let it go because it's the way to honor the past is to hold on to it, to honor you know, our ancestors who suffered so gravely. And, and yet if, if the society can't find a way to demark, you know, that was past, we are now in a present and we had the chance to build a future. There's too much of risk of then being in the thrall of the understandable instinct to revenge and the understandable instinct not to listen and the understandable instinct to hold on to our own narratives. You know, I think about my country right now where we are so divided that often the only thing we seem to have in common is that we agree we're divided. Um, but one of the other things that we have in common is that most people think we're right. That you get up in the morning and you know you're right. And the people mm -hmm. who disagree with you are just so completely wrong. That we share that even though we're on opposite sides and that sense of righteousness. And it's very hard to build a, a shared future uh, when we're all clenching so fiercely our sense of our righteousness. Yeah, and that is something we really know because one of the things living where I do is that the, the sides are so balanced. So both of these stories are constantly in the public domain. And that has been true for my whole adult life. And so everybody believes and uses the language of freedom, justice, peace, and righteousness. Everybody's using the same language. The struggle is over who's going to control the court, which defines whose version is going to actually get official status. What I was going to say to you is, is there a role here for social scientists, for historians, for people to tell a narrative that is somehow connected to a factual base? So it takes it slightly outside of simply the uh, my side or your side. So it tries to describe a little bit or tries to understand that and at least tries to change what the narrative is over time based on those elements because somehow or other 
those concepts of we have to find our way to a, a concept of freedom and justice. If we don't have that, then in some sense or other, we will be fighting for them through this process. So I suppose I'm wondering, is there a role there for academics too, to start to sketch out evidence and to bring that to the table as a way to deal with these things? Well, I hope so. Uh, I guess I'm speaking as an academic, but I, I, I don't wanna leave your point that people on competing sides embrace the same abstract values, so familiar, so true. Is there a way to turn that into a resource that we want that? And I think there's sometimes a slight chance to do so when people are in conversation about a future. So we want this in the future for our children, for our community. I think that the German experience the really the struggle over the history of what happened leading up to World War II, what happened during and after. The historians had, you know, a, a really quite explicit fight over it. It was an academic uh, enterprise and they hammered out uh, some, I wouldn't say change narrative, but a narrative of enough commonality that that became the core of curriculum that's taught across the country. And that's very different than what I've seen in some other places where, for example, the government picks a narrative and that becomes what's taught to the next generation or where you have competing narratives taught in different communities, which we're having that fight right now where there are legislatures that are passing laws telling history teachers what they're allowed to talk about and not talk about. That's not helpful. So in the middle of all of this, you know, there's a driver out of the revenge, which is somehow or other connecting us to the wrong. There is the complexity of finding formal structures. Uh, even if there's a necessity to find formal structures, there's the need to find a, a bigger social process, including art, including probably uh, social science and history, including religion, including relationship building, all of these things. So all of those things are, can be at least elements of something which begins to move us forward. The Maybe the million dollar question is the word forgiveness, to forgive. So I suppose my question to you is, first of all, what do you understand meaningful forgiveness in this situation to be? And are there some things where it doesn't, it shouldn't really apply. Um, but I suppose, what what do you see as the possibility, if not the role, at least the possibility that something like forgiveness might offer and when? That's more important, probably. The capacity to forgive is one of the greatest uh, powers that each of us have. It doesn't require any money. It doesn't require any pos social positions of power, but one of the elements that has to be true for it to be forgiveness is it has to be a cho choice. Uh, the individual or the society or the community involved has to want to forgive. I think forgiveness for me is can be defined as letting go of justified resentment justified grievance i mean it's not forgiveness if there wasn't a justified a, a really uh legitimate ground for offense and resentment is the psychological aspect of that sense of i've been harmed i've been wronged letting it go though is good for our mental health you know it was nelson mandela who said so powerfully that resentment is like drinking poison and then hoping that it'll kill your enemies it, it the 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 now it's been confirmed by massive studies in the healthcare medical context the burdens on people's bodies their mental toll their blood pressure etc of caring resentment, huge. Mental health is helped by forgiveness. But that said, it, you know, it's not helped by being ordered to forgive 
or being commanded not to talk anymore about what happened. You know, the temptation, and I'm falling into it here, is to easily slide from talking about the interpersonal to a collective. I think there are connections, but groups operate differently than individuals do. Um, I do think individuals often have a more peaceful, happier life if they find a way to move the resentment out of daily, everyday thinking. Uh, and I think there's a parallel for a group or a society or even a nation. But what is the comparable process for the group that the individual needs to go to in order to be able to choose? And, you know, my own sense is, as is true for the individual, there's not one answer. You know, for some, you know, practicing your whole life to be able to forgive so that the, when the moment comes, you have those muscles already developed. That's what some religious teachings cultivate. For others, you know, the process of forgiveness actually requires lots of psychological reflection um, and learning to distinguish myself from those others and the past from the present. And for still others, the forgiveness is possible because of a change in your circumstance, because you're now in a different place and you have a future and things to hope for and people who love you and you have more resources with which to forgive. I think that for a group, for a society, if you don't have that sense of there's something to hope for, something to build, it's very, very hard to let go. Very, very hard to forgive because the resentment is part of the definition of who we are. Yes, and is it, is it possible to, to start thinking of these things not as either ors, but as things that might together coexist in other words we need a legal process because the legal process has to be seen to name the wrong and be seen to be changing the context the group context within which we're working but the forgiveness is also a possibility which can accompany that at times or can change it or challenge it or move it and the part of the problem is we keep looking for a single solution we keep looking for a it's, that's not what it's going to be like. It's going to require all of our creativity. I know you're right. And I think that uh, anytime there's a chance to think about both and, we're going to be better off in terms of breaking out of the stuck places of either or thinking. And here in particular, the way in which there will be a two steps forward, one step back, um, and, you know, 10 years ago, we thought we had resolved it, but then it's back. It takes more work. Uh, next generation, well, we're not bound by the way in which our elders resolve their past. We want to revisit it. Uh, these are the kinds of issues that are not going to be put to bed forever. So both and uh, is right and psychological work and moral work and artistic work and legal work. It's a lot of work. A lot um, of work. A lot of work. I mean, I'm interested because in this country, for example, how do we, for example, talk about forgiveness on one side when one each side demands to be the person doing the forgiving and nobody, as somebody said, there's a supply and demand crisis. There's lots of demand, but no supply. Uh, and so we never mix it up. But then on the other side, I'm, I'm listening to America. I'm watching North America and I'm saying, you can't, there seems to be a growing polarization of what is wrong or who did what. And I suppose if we don't even agree on who counts as we, <laughs> uh, do we have to do some work on, 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 on the we before we can start having a process of, of justice? And are you concerned that we stop really talking about justice, but more talking about winning, if you like? I'm concerned about it all, and I am terribly concerned about uh, the dead end of uh, the oppression Olympics, 
who <laughs> suffered more? Well, that way, madness lives. There's enough suffering to go around. There's a there's a saying uh, from Korea that every finger can hurt. That I think it's so well put, and I just want to add to it in its own way. Every finger can hurt in its own way, and uh, we are as thinking, feeling beings exquisitely capable of knowing our own hurts. We are not always so great at understanding someone else's hurt. Um, and uh, I, I, I think we're often even scared that if we understand someone else's hurt, then we have to let go of our sense of our own injury. Um, I think that working on who is the we is the task of our time. It is in this country, it is in your country, it is globally. You know, there's a way in which the crises of the pandemic and climate change, you think would invite us all to see that the we is all of us because we're mutually implicated and what you do affects me and what I do affects you. But it hasn't had that effect. Instead, if anything, we are, we are more uh, filled with resentments and hatreds. I, I think, frankly, partly out of frustration and fear, but also partly social media, which escalates and amplifies the extremes. Um, so to we, have a we, we have to have a place to talk that's not separated by screens where people have disinhibition and can say hateful things or spray paint or, or what have you. And that's one of the, so one of the, one of the ways we, I think, have tried to create a climate. And I think South Africa was very, very clear about this was the right to tell the story into the public space was very important and the right to be heard by the judge or by on the behalf of the community and uh, I suppose with television audience. And storytelling has been one of the vehicles which has kind of done the rounds. My kind of, it's, it's not, I'm against it in the slightest. I, I personally think it's absolutely critical. The issue I have is, um, how do we move from storytelling and even truth telling to story hearing? In other words, have you seen any examples of how the, the right to tell becomes the right to be heard or the, the possibility to be heard? And, or, or are there processes we should think about, about how the stories of those harms, however deep, however long, however historic, can be told and allowed to be uh, heard for what, they, what their actual content is. You know, in South Africa, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was you know, certainly not perfect, but it had some good elements. And one was to allow survivors to speak without being cross-examined, without being interrupted, uh, to be able to tell their story. Um, and as you say, the mass media, you know, daily radio shows shared those stories and it became then the topic of dinner conversations and places that people had never heard these stories began to hear them. Um, I am intrigued right now by experiments in, under the name of restorative justice that take a form of, you know, somewhat ritualized, you know, people take turns telling their story, what happened. And even, having practice to restate, here's what I heard you say. Um, and one of the features of some restorative justice circles that have grown up in Australia and in Canada and some here in the US that I think is very good is, you know, people literally sit in a circle, take turns telling their story, do not begin with the name of their big position or their social status. Um, and over time, try to articulate how this bad thing that happened relates to each person in the room, not just in terms of who was hurt, but who contributed to it happening. And seeing that there are both kinds of connections that we have to wrongs, that we contributed to them as well as we are injured by them. And that, that's a vehicle. That's a beginning of beginning to listen, I think. 
I'd like to ask uh, Carl Small, which is the Dean of the Moritz School of Law in Ohio State to, to come in, because I'm sure listening to this from the US, you have a perspective and an interest, which is very current and very real. So Carl, would you like to ask a couple of questions? Uh, Duncan, you're very kind, and thank you for the promotion. Um, I'm I'm the director of the Divided Community Project, which is housed at the Moritz College of Law, <laughs> but it has its own dean. <laughs> so, uh, but thank you, and 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 what a wonderful time to join this conversation when you talk about you know restorative circles. Thank you for letting me sit in a circle with the two of you uh, to to focus on these questions. And, and you, have, you have said so many things uh, that I'm not going to try to restate because I couldn't restate them as well as you stated them the first time. But, but I did want to ask a question or two of Martha uh, and, and, and Duncan uh, uh, while I am here. And, and Martha, I'm particularly interested in your thoughts. I'd like to turn the focus maybe a little bit more to the U.S. situation. You know, in, in 1903, um, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois said the, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. It's now 2021 in the United States. Uh, we've left behind the summer of racial justice, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, uh, Breonna Taylor and others. There have been worldwide protests in support of Black Lives. Um, and what they have given rise to in part is a pushback, uh, a rise in white supremacy, domestic extremism, hate incidents. And you, you've already noted how politically polarized we are and, and uh, siloed in so many ways. I, I wonder, it feels like we're teetering on a fulcrum right now. And I wonder if you could share your thoughts as it relates to racial equity here. Are, are you more or less hopeful about the possibility of finding truth or justice in the United States? And, and if, either way, I guess, what do you think will be the key or, or the process that the US might use to forge a future to racial equity? Well, thank you. Uh, this is very top of mind for me. Um, my colleague and dear friend Randy Kennedy and I talk about it all the time and talk about how we're less hopeful now than we were 20 years ago, which is ironic because, you know, at least there's a fuller public conversation going on. But the United States has seen an unleashing and, and a kind of permission granting for a kind of overt racism that I thought was over. Not that it, we let, ha, had overcome racism, but the idea that it's acceptable to say it, that's uh, uh, a path that I thought we were not gonna go down and we are going down. Um, I think it is a time in the United States to stand back and look at the history full, full eyed without any pretense and to acknowledge the foundational original sin of slavery and to acknowledge that even the civil war and reconstruction amendments uh, were then undone systematically and to see that we have not had a reckoning in this country and we've had instead uh you know the, the tulsa massacre We've had the destruction of middle-class black communities and then the denial of the history. Um, and until we actually confront those details, not to mention the current facts, um, I don't think we have a chance of a shared future. And, and yes, as I mentioned before, I don't know what to make of what to do with the fact that we have the polarized politics of today now telling history teachers in high school, you can't talk about the following. This is the kind of phenomenon that goes on in totalitarian countries. You know, Russia right now has laws on the books that they can't talk about the offenses that Russia committed during World War II. That's what happens when you don't have a democracy. I, I do have some hope, you know, slight hope that maybe this is like the fever that's gonna break. Maybe it's 
so worrisome that we are turning a corner. You know, I am simultaneously involved in the conversations in institutions about reckoning with our racist past, and then trying to deal with these laws that are forbidding high school teachers from talking about racism. And it feels like, I, I don't know where to go, but it's where we are. Well, how, how can the United States have an honest conversation in that context? Um, you know, you we we've all we all know the past is is important. We we can't agree on the past as recent as what occurred on January 6, 2021. Uh, that's fresh in our minds and was witnessed on television. Uh, and we have got, as I said, this ongoing battle that you've described that has been um, is playing out in our communities concerning what teachers can teach about the past and from whose perspective they may teach it. How can we have an honest conversation in this country about, about issues of race so that the 21st century isn't, the 22nd century, I guess, isn't the problem of the color line all over again? Well, I know you're involved in you know, very uh, serious work along those lines, and I should turn the question back to you. I will say this, that United States can't have a conversation, but human beings can have a conversation. And the ways in which the polarization of the nation is depicted in our media and our stories about ourselves is not replicated at a local level, where in local communities, people actually have to shovel the snow together and figure out a way to get the garbage collected and deal with the sea rise that's happening in our communities. And I don't think it's by accident that there's greater trust in local government, greater trust in local media, greater trust about local schools than there is when you ask people about any of those things at a national level. I think that there's real insight in recognizing that face-to-face -face conversations among people who have some sense of a shared future that's a place to start. Um, and I also think this is one of the lessons back from the desegregation era where enough social science was conducted to show that simply putting people next to each other in the same classroom is not a way to build an integrated future. But working together on a, in a sports team or a newspaper in the schools that had desegregation that made those kinds of efforts had much more success. So not staring into each other's eyes at every minute, but looking out at the world together and rolling up our sleeves and working on something together, that's a place to start. You know, let me, let me ask you about um, something we've begun to see, and it is the generational differences uh, the difference between the generation of, of young activists in the United States and the, the older activists, and, and Duncan may be able to tell us whether there is some um, counterpart uh, in his experience. But Martha, as, as uh, you know, it's difficult, we found, for these younger generations to, sp uh, to speak to the older generation. They, they want it now. They're not interested in persuading. Uh, they're not interested much in listening. Uh, from the perspective of the younger generation, the older generation doesn't feel the same sense of urgency with respect to the issues that have been on their minds for 50 years. And now they can see progress perhaps being rolled back. And so how can we harness the strengths of each of the generations to uh, you know, and avoid these generational differences, perhaps that would interfere with them each achieving the goals they seek, which is a brighter future for for all. You put it so beautifully. You know, I think there are strengths that are present in both kinds of sensibilities. The urgency of now that the young uh, express is right now very palpable, but it, throughout history has often been the propeller for social justice movements. Um, 
And, uh, you know, it was Dr. King who said, uh, don't tell me to wait. You always tell me to wait. Um, I, I do think that there is a wisdom of the elders and it's not just because I have gray hair. Uh, I do think that there are lessons learned, but I, I also think that listening to each other is a task that we need to engage in. Fundamentally, though, I think that the challenge is how to find a we there so that a division, uh, the, divide, the division among people who actually share similar visions of the future could actually stymie the work that it's going to take to get there. And, and to, to, to have that sense of we, you know, frankly, I guess I'm very taken with the, the need to cultivate enough humility to know I have something to learn. And even though I have the gray hair, there's stuff I don't know. And I hope that there could be a similar reciprocal kind of humility among some of the younger people. You know, the old saying, right? You, you had no idea how much your elders knew until you reach the age of 30, or maybe they learn so much more in the meantime. But I, I, I also think that for me, a touchstone is I don't want to be the thing that I hate. And I fear that for a lot of young people, there is a sense that the scale of the wrongs are so large, it doesn't matter what we throw out on the way to writing them. Doesn't matter if we prevent someone else from speaking. It doesn't matter if we use violence um, because it's so terrible. And I guess that's the conversation that we really have to have because I think it does matter. And it matters both for us, do you become the thing that you hate? And also who gets hurt when violence is unleashed? And at least my reading of history, it's always the most vulnerable. Duncan wants to say something. I, I was just going to say, already in my own lifetime, I think I've lived through three turns of that screw in Northern Ireland. I think for a long time, some of what you say was true, that the, the anger was so great throughout the community that it was impossible to stop people got, uh, grabbing to violence and trying to seek it. The numbers were so equal that people hardly made any progress. So we went round in circles and the anger deepened and the hurt deepened. Yeah. We then went through a, sec a, a new generation where that story became the main story and it was the reason to do something else. In other words, we had to do something else except the violence, but we'd had, that was the next thing. And now I think as people are disappointed with some of the outcomes of the peace process, yeah. we have people who are uncertain, I would say at this point, they're uncertain. There are some people who want to say it's time to go back in their own way. There are other people, the majority still, who are very hesitant because they know another story. And as you say, the question of the wrongs, the question of the unresolved issues of the past are the things that still haunt. And I think, well, I, I, I'm i very taken with your question about the, the leadership that is required to get to a we uh, and, and what that takes, because some of that is about what is permitted in terms of denial. In other words, are we agreed there shouldn't be any denial because the importance of leadership here is about permission and what is permitted to to be forgotten or at least to be allowed to be the past and to be dealt with in a different way. And somewhere around that conversation, there's something missing. If the only question is feelings on the street, there has to be something discussed, something in the public conversation around how, how do we shape a way which can deal with all, all of these dimensions, because all of them will have to be dealt with. You know, you use the word feelings and I, you know, have throughout my life been so critical of institutions that squeeze out feelings and say, no, no, that's not the place here. We don't talk about that. But I actually think we are now so awash in feeling. We've yeah. gone the other extreme. Um, and we have to find some way to actually yeah. summon up the ability to reason and the ability to put the feelings over there. Um, and that takes hard work. 
Well, let me let me interrupt there uh, and thank you both. Um, uh, first and foremost, um, thank you, Martha, uh, for joining us today and and talking about facing the past forges the future. Uh, as I said, there are so many insights that you shared with us that I'm going to be thinking about and, and talking to my colleagues about for for days and weeks to come. And I'm, I'm so glad that you were able to spend some time with us. And Duncan Morrow, it's always a pleasure and, and a privilege yeah, yeah. to be with you um, and, and to hear your deep insights. Uh, the, the two of you together talking about constructive ways to contextualize the past, learn from it, uh, not you know, commit ourselves not to repeat uh, the mistakes that we've made in the past um, is, is what it's going to take to build a, a, a brighter possibility for our communities in the future. And we are so grateful for, for the conversation you shared with us today. Uh, I, I, I think it's now my responsibility to close our program and, and in doing so, I'd, I'd simply like to say my thanks as well to uh, the Mershon Center for International Studies, uh, which uh, has hosted this and, and is a co-host with us, the Corey Mueller community, uh, Ulster University, Belfast, uh, and my colleagues at the Divided Community Project. Uh, Terry Murphy, Chris Jolpe, uh, you have been wonderful uh, hosts uh, at the Mershon Center, and we are, we are privileged to be partners with you in this work. Um, I also lastly want to remind uh, our audience that there's going to be a program on November 9, beginning at 11.30 Eastern time uh, in the United States uh, with Dr. Byron Bland from Stanford University. The title of the conversation will be A Shared or Splintered Future, Two Ways of Living with Polarization. We hope you'll join us on November 9. So with that, Martha and Duncan, thank you again so much. And to our audience, thank you for being with us. Uh, we'll bring this part of the conversation to a close. Be safe and take care.